Hello everyone and welcome to the seminar. Today I will talk about the regulation of immune cell function by the lymphatic endothelium. Before I begin, I would like to give a self-introduction. I am a visiting scholar here at KAIST, active in the lab of Professor Gu Yong Ko. My home base is in the lab of Professor Taya Mackinen at Uppsala University in Sweden. I have the privilege to work in the lab of these two leading lymphatic vessel biology scientists and I'm happy to share data on some of the projects from both institutes. If you are interested in learning more about lymphatic vessel biology, please visit our homepages or follow us on Twitter. Today I will talk about how the lymphatic vessel endothelium can regulate immune cells and their function. Since I did not know the level of previous knowledge on this topic of my audience, I will firstly begin with a very broad introduction on inflammation and the response during inflammation by the immune system and the vascular system. Since my talk will focus on novel concepts that are emerging in vascular biology and immunology, I think it's important to set the stage with these introductory slides on what is already the dogma. My talk will then focus on the current research on molecules that are expressed by lymphatic endothelium and how they regulate immunity. Herein I will also talk about two projects in which I have been involved. Lastly, I will end with a summary and open for questions. To begin with, we first need a definition of what inflammation is. Inflammation is described as a localized immunovascular response due to an inflammatory stimuli, including trauma, foreign body, infection, or immune reaction. There are five cardinal signs of inflammation. The first four were already described some 2000 years ago by Cornelius Celsus. They are redness, swelling, heat, and pain. The last sign, loss of function, is attributed to Rudolf Virchow, on the right-hand side are their names described in Latin. Now looking back at the definition, we already get some very important information here. And those are the four main causes of inflammation, which include trauma, foreign body, infection, or immune reaction. These are very broad concepts, which can cover many things. If we look closer at trauma, it can include causes such as ischemia, which is reduced blood flow and thus reduced oxygen, physical or chemical trauma, such as cold, radiation or poison and pressure sores. The second causes are foreign bodies, which are usually intact materials. They can be either external, such as wood splinters, titanium or silicone implants, or they can be internal, such as the formation of uric acid or cholesterol crystals. Thirdly, there is infection, and that is probably what most of us associate with inflammation. It can be caused by either bacteria, viruses, parasites or fungi. Lastly, inflammation caused by immune reactions include hypersensitivity, cell or antigen-antibody reactions, neoplasia, or autoimmunity. These are mainly a consequence of a dysfunctional immune system. If we go back once again to the definition of inflammation, we can notice that inflammation is localized immunovascular response to either one or a combination of those four causes. The immunovascular response contains both the immune and vascular system. Firstly, let's have a look at the immune response. Immunity is divided into the innate and adaptive immunity. The innate is a nonspecific response, meaning that it responds to any kind of inflammatory stimuli and it is very fast, usually responding within minutes to hours. The innate immune response includes a group of phagocytes, granulocytes, mast cells, gamma delta T cells, NK and NK T cells, as well as proteins of the complement system. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, is a specific immune response, 
This means that cells of the adaptive immunity, which are B and T cells, need to recognize and react towards an antigen in order to be activated. Antigens are short protein peptides. Dendritic cells of the innate immune response are considered to be the bridging cells between the innate and adaptive immune response, since they can phagocytize and digest proteins and later present them on their surface, which in turn is needed to activate either B or T cells. They are so-called antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. Other cells that are also APCs are macrophages and B cells. Looking at the vascular response, it mainly concerns the response of blood vessels at tissue level at the transition from arterioles to venules. These are blood capillaries that respond in three different ways. Firstly, they will dilate, and the dilation will lead to a local increase in blood flow. Secondly, permeability will increase, allowing for fluid and proteins to leave the blood and enter the damaged tissues. Thirdly, the vascular endothelial cells will express adhesion molecules on their luminal side, allowing for immune cells from the blood to attach and enter into the tissue. Like we just discussed, the first cells that will enter in response to inflammation are cells of the innate adaptive system, whereas later also B and T cells will enter the tissue. So, where do lymphatic vessels fit in this picture and why are they so important? Well, firstly, I would like to explain what lymphatic vessels are. They are a blind-ended vascular network that maintain tissue homeostasis by clearing the interstitial tissue fluid from a range of organs such as the brain, lung, heart, skin, intestines. Specifically, the discovery of meningeal lymphatics in the brain was done in part by the lab of Professor Kuyonku here at KAIST. The fluid from tissue is taken up by these blunt-ended capillaries, as we can see in this image here to the right. The blunt-ended capillaries are believed to have a high capacity to absorb tissue fluid since their junctional proteins and basement membranes are discontinuous. Moreover, Immune cells from the tissue can enter these capillaries and reach downstream draining lymph nodes. They will, for instance, follow a gradient of the chemokine CCL21, as we can see here stained in green in this image, which is highly expressed on lymphatic capillaries. Further down, the collecting lymphatic vessels will have valves, as we can see here, and the staining with laminin alpha 5 in order to prevent backflow of the fluid. Moreover, these collecting vessels are covered by smooth muscle cells, as seen here with the staining of anti-smooth muscle actin, and these actively propel the fluid forward by contraction. The lymphatics can influence the immune cells at numerous locations either in the periphery as the cells exit the tissues or within the lymph node when they enter within the lymph node parenchyma or as they exit the lymph node. I will talk about different types of molecules and how exactly they can influence immune cell function. I will start with the chemokine CCL21 and its scavenger receptor ACKR4, also called CCRL1. CCL21 is a chemokine that is produced by lymphatic endothelial cells. From now on, I will call them LECs. In the periphery, that is, in tissues, studies have shown that not only do LECs produce CCL21, but CCL21 is deposited in a gradient from LECs, with the concentration becoming lower the further away from the lymphatic endothelium, as we can see here in the lower image. Dendritic cells will recognize CCL21 through their receptor CCR7 and they will bind and actively migrate towards the higher gradient, which becomes higher 
further down in the capillary. The gradient will help to propel the migrating dendritic cells in the right direction towards the lymph node. However, recent research has shown that within the capillaries, CCL21 is sequestered within Lex through a scavenger receptor called ACKR4. This receptor is expressed on capillary Lex and is responsible for storing CCL21 within the cells. The reason is that once the cell is inside a capillary, it will be propelled forward passively through the contraction of smooth muscle cells and thus does not need to migrate towards the chemokine gradient. Similarly, once the cell reaches the lymph node, it will need to pass through the subcapsular sinus, which is a bilayer of lymphatic endothelial cells that encapsulates the entire lymph node. In order for the dendritic cells to migrate in the right direction so that it enters the lymph node, the legs of the so-called ceiling of the subcapsular sinus will express the atypical receptor CCRL1 and sequester CCL21, whereas floor legs will produce the CCL21 gradient, directing the dendritic cells to transmigrate between them and into the lymph node. As we can see in these images, both CCL RL1 and CCL21 are highly stained in the ceiling legs, and the gradient of CCL21 is deeper into the lymph node. What I have told you so far can be summarized here. We have a cause of inflammation to which there is a vascular and an immunological response. Various immune cells from the circulation will enter the tissue through blood capillaries, although for the sake of illustration I have only depicted a T-cell here. Those cells will then respond to the cause of inflammation and dendritic cells within the tissue will sample antigens and bring them to the lymph node through a CCL21 mediated gradient in the lymphatic vessels. Next, I will describe how CCL2 can also have a function in recruiting immune cells into the tissue and how it can sustain lymph angiogenesis during pathology. Our group at Uppsala University recently published a paper that describes a new type of immune interacting leg during lymphatic malformations. In this study, we used a mouse model of lymphatic malformations in the skin encoding the oncogenic mutation in PIK3CA, P110-alpha PI3K. We could specifically induce the mutation in Lex by having the Cree driver at the VGF receptor 3 locus. And we could observe a lymphatic response with sprouting cells that were also highly proliferating. As we can see here with the EDU and KI67 enumeration. We could also see that the lymphatic response was accompanied with an increase in immune cell infiltrates. At the early time points, at five weeks, which is two weeks after induction of the mutation, we could observe a high infiltrate of innate cells, such as macrophages and dendritic cells. Whereas later time points, we could also observe an increase of infiltration in adaptive immune cells such as T-cells and B-cells. In order to better understand what is driving the early recruitment of innate cells, we did single-cell sequencing on control and mutant ear skin. We could observe clusters of the lymphatic endothelium that corresponds to the valves, the collecting endothelium, and the capillaries. In the mutant, however, we could also see three different clusters that were PTX3 positive at the capillary ends. Seen down here where the red cells represent the mutant cells, these clusters are absent in the wild type. And up here we can see that they are highly enriched for PTX3 expression. Two of these clusters contain genes that were enriched in terms for proliferation and metabolism. 
We could also observe in staining of the ear skin that PTX3 was indeed enhanced and highly expressed in the pro proliferating capillary ends in the lymphatic malformations. We then looked closer at the gene signature of the PTX3 capillary ends and could observe upregulated receptors, genes for extracellular matrix remodeling, TNF signaling, as well as chemokines. Of particular interest, we noticed that the chemokine CCL2 was enhanced and could also observe this on a staining of the ear dermal lymphatics in the mutant, but not in the control as well as in isolated primary mutant cells by measuring expression levels with qPCR. In addition, in the ear lysates, we could measure high levels of CCL2. Not only that, but we could see that the infiltrating microphages were pr also producing high levels of VGFC, which is a driver of lymphatic endothelium proliferation suggesting that there may be a positive feedback loop between CCL2 producing mutant selects and the infiltrating VEGFC producing macrophages. To test this hypothesis, we treated animals with an anti-CCL2 antibody after induction of the mutation, and indeed we could observe that there was a decrease in the expansion of the lymphatic endothelium. So now we can also add CCL2 producing LEX at the very end of lymphatic capillaries in the context of lymphatic malformation. Importantly, CCL2 will recruit macrophages that in turn release lymph angiogenic VEGFC, which will in turn worsen the disease progression. Next, let's look at interleukin-7 and S1P production by lymphatic endothelial cells within the lymph node. Within the lymph node, clusters of B cells will be situated directly underneath the subcapsular sinus, where they form B cell follicles. T cells, on the other hand, are localized in the more central parts of the lymph node parenchyma. They are closely situated next to the lymphatic network, which is the medullary sinus and the medullary cords. Immune cells will enter the lymph node either through afferent lymphatic vessels that drain the tissue and are connected to the lymph node through the subcapsular sinus or through high endothelial venules, which are specialized blood venules that are present throughout the lymph node. They are not pictured in this staining. Majority of immune cells will in fact enter the lymph node through these venules. In order for cells to exit the lymph node, they need to transverse and leave through the medullary sinuses which are made up of legs. They will enter the downstream efferent lymphatics, which eventually joins the bloodstream again through the connection of major lymphatic ducts into veins. Early studies using a fluorescent uh, reporter mouse could show that within the medullary sinuses, legs produce the interleukin-7, which is important to sustain T-cell survival and homeostasis. In addition, medullary sinus legs will also produce S1P, which is a chemokine. S1P will bind S1RP1 on immune cells, allowing for the egress out of the lymph node. Moreover, it was also recently shown that S1P can also be produced by lymphatics in the periphery at the capillary ends, allowing T cells to enter the lymphatic circulation from the tissue. We can now have a closer look at the lymph node itself, and we can add interleukin-7 as produced by the medullary sinus legs, as well as S1P. Next, let's look at another scavenger receptor called MARCO. MARCO is another scavenger receptor that is highly expressed in the medullary sinus legs in the lymph node. Previous work has shown that legs in the lymph node are able to capture and archive viral antigens for several weeks. In addition, these legs seem to be able to exchange antigen with dendritic cells 
and could thus influence T cell function long after viral clearance. Marco, however, seems to be able to capture viruses and prevent their further dissemination. In this image, we can see how viral particles labeled with M. cherry are co-localized with Marco expression in the wild-type animals, but not in the Marco knockout. So we can now add Marco as a novel molecule expressed on medullary sinus legs with the potential to influence antiviral immune response. Next, let's have a look at MHC class 1 and 2, as well as PDL1. In order for T cells to become activated, they need three signals from dendritic cells. Antigen that is presented on MHC class 1 or MHC class 2 molecules, co stimulation, which could be an array of co stimulatory or co inhibitory receptor ligand interactions, and finally, they need cytokines. The nature of these cytokines and co stimulation will ultimately affect the fate that that particular T cell has. Although legs themselves have not shown to be professional antigen presenting cells, they do in fact express some of these molecules. One such is PDL1, which is a co inhibitory molecule that binds to PD1 on T cells. Expression of PDL1 by medullary sinus legs and subcapsular floor legs will lead to the deletion of CD8 T cells through programmed cell death. Moreover, Lex in the lymph node can also express self-antigens on MHC class 1 molecule, thus deleting autoreactive CD8 T cells. It has also been shown that Lex can acquire MHC class 2 molecules that have been preloaded from dendritic cells, and thus also inhibit activation of CD4 T cells. When co-cultured with dendritic cells, both lymphatic endothelial cells and FRCs of the lymph node will acquire MHC class 2 expression. So, we can now add PDL1 to a list of leg proteins that can influence T cell function. Although I did not show you, PDL1 can also be expressed by legs in the periphery during tumor setting. Lastly, I will tell you about a project that we recently started to work on here at KAIST, which deals with Nectin 2. Nectin 2 is part of the Nectin immunoglobulin superfamily, which has a total of 9 members. It is also called PVRL2 or CD112. It can normally be found in the endothelial junctions where it can interact with other nectins either homophilically or heterophilically or bind to cadherins. However, some nectins also have a role as a co-receptor, where they can be expressed either on antigen-presenting cells or tumor cells. And by binding receptors on effector cells such as T cells or NK cells, they can act either as a co-stimulatory or a co-inhibitory molecule. Nectin 2 has the strongest binding affinity to CD112 receptor, which transmits an inhibitory signal to the T cell. Thus, it dampens the immune response. Through single cell RNA sequencing of the mouse lung done at Uppsala University, we could identify a cluster of cells that represent the lymphatic endothelium. These cells have a high level of expression of Nectin 2. In contrast to the blood endothelium, which do not express Nectin 2 in the lung, but do express it in other tissues. That is also something that we have confirmed in stainings. Looking at data generated by Imgen, it is also reported that legs within the lymph node express high levels of Nectin 2, whereas NK cells and CD8 T cells express high levels of its receptor CD112 receptor. Based on the potential role of Nectin 2 as a lymphatic endothelium immunoregulator, we decided to investigate closer the role of Nectin 2 in legs in the lung environment and the lung draining lymph nodes. For this reason, we are performing experiments with nasal application of influenza A virus to investigate the lymphatic response after 
virus clearance. We are using a transgenic mouse line that carries a GFP reporter at the PROX1 gene, allowing us to visualize lymphatics. And with the cre lock -SP system, we can delete Nectin2 specifically in the lymphatic endothelium. We utilize the imaging techniques that exist in the lab of Professor Kuyong Ku and could visualize dramatic changes in the lymphatic vessel network in the lung, as seen here by the PROX1 GFP reporter. The project is still ongoing, and we hope to find clues to whether or not lymphatic Nectin2 can also influence the immune system in the response and in the context of influenza. To summarize, I have shown you some of the molecules that are expressed in the periphery by lymphatic endothelial cells, as well as within the lymph node. There are many other proteins that are like derived that influence the immune system that I did not discuss here, and new discoveries are slowly starting to unravel the fact that lymphatic vessels are not just a passive transport system, but indeed have a direct role in regulating the immune response. Future experiments will also show whether or not Nectin-2 in the lung lymphatic endothelium also might have a role. Finally, I would like to thank Professor Taya Mekinen and Professor Gu Yong Ku that allowed me to work on such exciting projects. I would also like to thank our collaborators that have helped us with the influenza virus. The lab of Steven Turner at Monash University kindly provided us with an aliquot of the virus and the lab of GMO have helped us with the viral infection experiments. Thank you for listening and please feel free to contact me should you have any questions.